Will shock activism make people listen? I don't know. Will it make people more likely to agree with you when you yell them in the face? Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gita Mary and today I have a video that I've been thinking about doing for a really long time actually, but I do realize that this is a bit of a minefield, but I think it's important to have these conversations within the sustainability movement, within the climate movement. And I've been thinking about this for a long time actually, and every time I open my newsfeed, it always makes me want to talk about this. And then recently something happened that made me definitely decide to definitely talk about it anyway. There has recently been an increase in shock activism from climate activists, and I think it's very important that we talk about it. Not very long ago, Extinction Rebellion poured milk onto the floors in Harrods, which also made me want to talk about this. So this is not something that just happened out of nowhere. There's sort of been an increase over a long period of time, but this is something we have always seen within the climate movement. I think one thing that's changing right now is how much much attention this gets and how much press it gets. Um, so that makes it more important and more impactful, etc. Which makes it more important that we talk about it. Okay. Because even more recently, as in last week, two activists from Just Stop Oil put tomato soup on a Van Gogh painting in National Gallery. I would like to add here, by the way, that Van Gogh's sunflowers were not actually destroyed. The painting is protected by a layer of glass, so only minor damages to the frame actually occurred. Now I could attack this from many different angles, but what I want to do specifically today is talk about this specific example in National Gallery and sort of use that as a stepping stone to have a larger discussion about whether or not this kind of shock activism actually has an impact. One of the first and more basic questions that I've seen pop up a lot is why Van Gogh? The short answer is that Van Gogh's paintings specifically invokes a lot of emotions in a lot of people. They're very emotional visually and especially if you know something about the artist's background, they become even more emotional. Personally, I have loved his art ever since I started loving art, basically. So throughout the majority of my life and I have read books, countless books, seen movies, everything that's come out about Van Gogh and when I saw the sunflowers in National Gallery for the first time I cried. Art has this amazing effect on people. It can make us full of joy or full of sadness but it invokes a lot of emotions in us and this is something we've seen throughout the entirety of human history. Whenever humans are desperate or need to create attention or effect in a certain population we destroy our we destroy artifacts, we destroy culture, and we do that in the name of activism, war, vandalism, etc. It's a powerful tool that we have always used. It's not a new invention, so to speak, that we destroy art for the sake of attention towards a certain subject. It's something we have been doing throughout the entirety of human history because it is an incredibly effective tool. We're talking about it now, aren't we? Remember in 2019 when Notre Dame burned down, how quickly billionaires were able to collect funds for its rebuild. It's because we have certain emotions attached to objects of culture and art. And it's a very, very primal function of the human brain. It touches us on a very deep emotional level because it's a part of our very primitive makeup as humans. And as such, destroying art or culture is a very effective way of communicating a certain message because people will definitely take notice. Now that was sort of the big why Van Gogh. I think this is the reason. I think that the emotional attachment to the painting is the primary reason for why it's Van Gogh. Then you could sort of talk about how he as a painter was very attached to nature, how he used oil painting. I think all those are pretty moot points. I think it's because of the emotional attachment to this painting. But another thing that I have seen during my research as well as like generally the media coverage of this issue is related to something much more sinister as well as much more interesting. Conspiracy theories about who was actually behind this activism started popping up everywhere. And I think this is really, really important that we talk about because this has spread like wildfire and I've already gotten comments on my DMs and on TikTok about whether or not this is true. So let's just talk about it. There is a conspiracy theory that organizations like Extinction Rebellion as well as Just Stop Oil are really funded by Big Oil and its primary purpose is to make eco-activists look really bad. This is not true. 
So this conspiracy theory started primarily because one of the supporters of both these movements, both Just Stop Oil as well as Extinction Rebellion, is Eileen Getty. And Eileen Getty is an heiress of the Getty family, which made their huge fortune in fossil fuels. However, the Getty family hasn't been involved with fossil fuels in many decades. And it is true that Eileen Getty is supporting these organizations with huge amounts of money. However, I think that has more to do with her having a bad conscience about where her family got their wealth from. You can find all her donations to these platforms, to these organizations on public record. With one Google search, you can find out when and how much money she actually donated to these organizations. It's all, it's all there. And I assume that if Big Oil had some conspiracy, it would be a little bit harder to find out. Because while Big Oil isn't necessarily making environmentalism look bad through fake activism, Environmentalists are making environmentalists look bad. Overall, the mass population reacting to this activism has predominantly been negative and skeptical and outright furious. <laughs> However, for this video, I don't want to focus on how the broader population has received this activism because I do think that is pretty obvious. These activists intended to draw attention towards a subject with shock factor and surprise, it worked. What I think is a lot more interesting is looking at how other climate activists within our movement has reacted here. Because I saw some pretty alarming reactions when I scrolled through my newsfeed. What I saw from many different activists, platforms, feeds, etc. was that we need to stand together as a climate movement. We need to support each other and even if we think something feels uncomfortable, we need to support the movement overall because there's only one movement and we need to show solidarity for the activists that performed this stunt. I think that is some of the most alarming thing I have ever read in my entire life and it seemed like not a lot of people were pointing this out. No matter the movement, no matter your affiliation, no matter political party, ideology, no matter religion, no matter your political opinion and what kind of movement you're affiliated with, not being allowed to criticize what they do is the biggest red flag there is. Always be able or allow yourself to disagree with things that happen within a movement that you overall agree with. I would actually say that it is absolutely essential that you can do that because when a lot of people come together, you will disagree on things also within a movement that's about saving the planet and the greater good, etc. The validity of that movement completely falls apart if no one feels comfortable criticizing what's happening within it. I just, I just got the X so thoroughly throughout my entire body. We need to show solidarity and support them because we are all one movement. Sure. I just think that with, it's so lame. <laughs> it's, so, it's so lame. And you can transfer this onto any other type of movement to sort of really see or feel how bad that is if we have that feeling or notion about a political party not wanting to or being able to criticize what a political party is doing even if they respect your ideology that's pretty bad not feeling that you're able to criticize the religious institute that you're supporting that's also pretty bad as such we also need to be able to criticize what's happening within environmentalism it's essential that we do so. Another thing that I see every time I see someone criticizing anything that has to do with climate activism is that you shouldn't criticize climate activism if you don't have a better solution. Even when you have nothing else to say other than, I hate that, no thank you, you're allowed to say that. Simply shutting down normal consumers, normal people from engaging in conversations about climate because they don't have all the solutions is very counterproductive. We need everybody to feel comfortable talking about climate action because that's honestly one of the most important things about activism. It's feeling comfortable talking about these things because if we don't feel comfortable talking about these things, there's absolutely no way we're gonna act on them. So it does not help to gatekeep who can say something and who cannot. Another thing I noticed a lot of people talking about online was about the activists themselves. And obviously I want to always treat people with kindness and respect, but we do have to talk about people because people were responsible. So one of the things that I see a lot of people say online is that the people in the video, the, the activists performing the stunt was incredibly brave 
and now that a lot of criticism is howling down on them, we should really focus on them as a community, as a sustainability movement, and lift them up because it must be really terrifying and really tough going through all this public negativity and skepsis and hatred. They are adults, first of all. It, we are allowed to talk about something they did in public when it was filmed and recorded and it was with all the intentions in the world that we talk about them. So obviously we are allowed to talk about them. It's uncool to call people names or be excessively mean or organize personalized attacks on someone based on their ideology. Uncool. But talking about them as activists when they performed activism is fine and okay. Obviously, they have a lot of guts. They are desperate and scared and frustrated and angry and all those emotions I can absolutely relate to. The thing is, we don't perform our best when we're scared and desperate and frustrated and angry. And that's not something only related to environmentalism, but overall, we do really stupid things when we're scared. As such, I think it's very important to not mistake recklessness for bravery. Now, this is a doozy, and I saw this on my social media, and I also saw it in some of the comments that I got from you guys about your thoughts. And it goes sort of like, why do people care more about this stupid painting than they do about the planet? Which I think, from start to finish, is an absolutely insane comparison. <laughs> people don't care more about the painting than they do about the planet. Those two objects or aspects of living are so vastly different, our brain comprehends them in two very different ways. And I don't know why I'm talking so much about brains today, but it just, it makes a lot of sense. The brain, the human brain, is primitive and simple and stupid, overall. That's just what it is. We have a much easier time acknowledging problems that are physical or right in front of us or have a size that we in our brains can comprehend. The size of the planet and the issues with the planet, especially those that we cannot see right now, are much harder to comprehend. And as such, we store that knowledge completely differently from how we talk about or think about art, a physical piece of art in front of us that many of us have seen in real life. And I think it's also unfair to assume that everyone who cares about art doesn't care about the planet. It doesn't make sense. On the other side of the spectrum, a lot of the criticism that I see about this type of stunt activism does also not really have a lot of merit. One thing that I see people pointing towards time and time again is, well, they're wasting food. They're wasting two cans of tomato soup. I think we will be fine. I feel it has sort of the same energy as pointing out that maybe we should eat less meat and then someone discrediting you by saying, well, didn't you drive here? It's not the food waste. That's the problematic part of this. Um, if you think two cans of tomato soup being wasted was the most horrific thing that happened here, I will invite you to look at the dumpsters behind every supermarket ever. If you want to criticize this activism, all I'm asking is that you find a salient topic to criticize. <laughs> Next up we have, it's a necessary evil. The planet is being vandalized in order to get the attention from people and from make people to listen. It's a necessary evil we have to take. I don't think I have to explain further how I stand on this issue. <laughs> so yes, in a scenario where there is a direct correlation between destroying a precious piece of art and saving the planet, if destroying that piece of art guaranteed that we found the solutions and executed the solutions to climate change, I would absolutely be first in line to put Van Gogh on fire. Okay, I love Van Gogh. I would be first in line if there was a direct correlation, if we knew for certain that within the crumbles of this painting were all our solutions and if we just destroyed it like the press of a button, things would be okay. However, <laughs> That's not really what is happening. And I think this mentality of like, it's a necessary evil, although there's no correlation between these two things, is something that some people say when they are not quite certain how to criticize the movement they're in. Or perhaps some people feel like if they criticize any aspect of the movement, they're bad environmentalists. However, we are all bad environmentalists anyway, so we don't need to worry about that. No one is perfect, we have established this. And lastly, and this is something that I think is incredibly important, and that's, well, people are talking about it now, people are listening, so it worked. I don't think that's what's happening. See, just because people are consuming content about this, just because people are talking about it, or just because they are noticing it, or even listening to what's happening in the news, 
doesn't mean that they will change their behavior, vote differently, and it certainly doesn't mean that big oil and the fossil fuel industry will listen and change their behavior. It's sort of the same as implying that when you yell someone in the face, they're more likely to agree with you. When it often turns out, it has the complete opposite effect. So do I think this type of activism is helpful? No, not in particular, honestly. But I think the functionality of this type of activism depends on what you want with it, what you want to do with it. Do you want to just draw attention towards something because then you absolutely succeed? But do you want a broader and more thorough comprehension of sustainability and of the damage that's being done to our planet by these industries? I don't think you're achieving that and it seems like that would be more helpful. It's really an ineffective way of communicating a very complex issue. And already I have issues with the entirety of the slogan of the, the, the movement in and of itself, the organization Just Stop Oil. Facing out fossil fuels has to do just that, facing it out. You have to face it out. If everybody just stopped using oil now, our society would be in ruins. <laughs> Seriously, it needs to be phased out. Overall, I think activism like this has a tendency to create more distance between consumers, between activists, between more people, between consumers and activists, between consumers and government, and between consumers or activists and industry. It does very, very little to establish that relationship that we need in order to really fix these things. And as such, I often end up interpreting these type of shock value uh, actions as something that comes from a place of desperation, anger and fury, but also narcissism. There is an egocentric feature to this. And that's why I often have a problem with activists doing these kinds of things, being labeled as super, super brave, because I think it would be a lot braver to actually engage in conversations with the people that are responsible for these things, working with the system, using these resources to communicate with these industries on how we can improve and put pressure both politically and in the industry to actually do something. Throwing tomato soup at a painting is easy compared to those conversations. I would also like to point out that movements like this that typically do this type of activism rarely does it exclusively. More often than not, they are also working with the industry and they are also getting politically engaged and they are also organizing happenings and events that are less dramatic than this one. As such, it might be important to remember that shock activism, helpful or not, is only one part of what is happening in these organizations. And furthermore, the only people that are really getting positively impacted by this type of activism are people that are already within the movement or people that are already experiencing the same symptoms as they are. So desperation, fury, anger that's also the reach that this kind of environmentalism has it's not including other people in the conversation it's more so reinforcing the feelings and the emotions that are already present within the movement it's an echo chamber with glass walls because we can all see what's happening but if we don't already connect with those emotions we won't get anything positive from what's happening, from what we're witnessing. It's alienating the majority in a time where we really desperately need the majority because it's the majority that win elections. It's the majority that can change supply and demand. But since I have the audacity to criticize this activism, here are some of my solutions or improvements, things that we could do that would have a better and more positive impact and also a more effective impact than throwing soup. First of all, vote. It's one of the least things that we can do. Voting for politicians and for parties with ambitious climate policies is so absolutely essential. Number two, change your bank. The majority of banks today are investing in fossil fuels and I have a video and a guide on how to invest sustainably as well as how to figure out if your bank is investing in fossil fuels and what you can do about it. Consumers have a massive passive impact when it comes to what kind of bank that we're choosing and how they invest our money. Protest, I am not against protests or activism, but protests that put pressure on the right people that are accountable in the right situations at the right points in time is so much more effective than vandalizing art. Hold corporations accountable either by reaching out to them or talking to other people about them, supporting organizations that are putting political pressure 
on these corporations is also absolutely essential. We also need people within the industry to help change it. We need engineers and we need scientists and we need people that are on the side of renewable and sustainable energy to get involved and more people continuously to become involved in that industry as well. Also reach out to your local political representatives and hold them accountable for their climate policies and put pressure on them to be more ambitious. Or even better, get engaged politically yourself. And this is perhaps the most important thing that we can start doing already today. Talk about it. Talk about sustainability, environmentalism, activism, climate change and what we can do. Talk to people about it. There is nothing that will come from feeling uncomfortable talking about these things. We will not change anything if we are unwilling to talk about it, to not hold people accountable or try to change people, but simply normalizing the discussion and talking about what we can do is one of the most effective steps that we can take. And all the other things that we can do are dependent on our ability to vocalize our emotions about environmentalism, about climate change, what we think is possible solutions, etc. Talking about it has a much bigger impact than you might expect. And with that being said, that was it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you will leave your thoughts down below and we can have a conversation. Let me know down below if you are for or against this type of activism or environmentalism. I would love to have a conversation with you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and take really good care of yourselves. Until next time. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys helped me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye.